Hey folks, this video contains full spoilers for the video game Kentucky Route Zero. I don't think Kentucky Route Zero is the sort of game that can be spoiled, but if you're looking to play it and want to go in fresh without knowing any of what's coming, I understand. You can always bookmark this video and come back to it when you finish the game. I promise it'll be waiting for you. Uh, this video also discusses Pedro Pietri's poem Puerto Rican Obituary in depth but doesn't contain a full reading of the poem. I've included links to both the written poem and a recording of Pietri reciting the poem in the description, and I heavily recommend checking out one or both before watching this video. The first time I read Pedro Pietri's 1973 poem, Puerto Rican Obituary, I thought of home. This surprised me, since my small mountain town in North Carolina is worlds away from Spanish Harlem where the poem takes place, or Puerto Rico where its subjects are from, but there was still something recognizably Appalachian in this movement poem from the 1970s. Maybe it was the debt, the constant cycle of work, the shame and the eccentricities of their speech. Maybe it was the pride the narrator and the external force took in their backgrounds, a pride that the subjects themselves didn't feel or even know how to feel. Maybe it was the perversion of cultural ceremonies, the subjects engaged in fortune telling and seances to try to scry the winning lottery numbers, just as folks from my neck of the woods have bought into prosperity gospels, or have tried to monetize old mountain stories and magics to get enough money from tourists to make it another week. Whenever I open my impossibly large copy of the Norton Anthology of Latino Literature, I somehow always open it to Puerto Rican Obituary. I feel a connection to the poem that's frankly not mine to feel. I'm not Puerto Rican or Latinx or bilingual. I'm an outsider, feeling a connection with someone else's pride. The first time I played Cardboard Computer's 2013 to 2020 video game, Kentucky Route Zero, I also thought of home. This was less surprising, since the game is set in Appalachia. It's got the look and feel of rural Appalachia downright, the architecture of the houses and barns, the ever-present mountains rising in the background, the style of speech that's succinct but conveys so much more than what's said. It's also got much more than those surface elements, right? As the game's story leaves the familiarity of the mountains behind and delves into the vast, fictive, underground network of caves, oceans, impossible spaces, colossal museums, hellish warehouses, and unimaginably tangled bureaucracies, the game never stops being recognizably about my home. There's a huge diversity of background, nationality, and experience among the cast of this game, just like in my home. Not everyone speaks in a noticeably Appalachian dialect in this game. Hell, I'd say the majority of the voice acting doesn't, and neither do I, nor do many of the people I know at home. It's a game in which ostensibly uninhabited locales reveal themselves to be dotted with pockets of humanity, each with their own lives and stories doing what they can to stay afloat, sometimes literally. These people each have their own reasons for being where they are, their own passions, their own fears, and for each of them, these extraordinary lives are entirely ordinary. This, to me, is quintessentially Appalachian. You can explore these seemingly untouched spaces, and you'll always find something that isn't new, only new to you. Someone will have always already reached it. In my home, the tourist shops sell Bigfoot merchandise, always trying to play up this idea that there are Sasquatches living in the forests carpeting the mountains. None of the locals care at all about this Bigfoot narrative, though. One of the defining differences between locals and outsiders is that outsiders see the seeming wilderness and imagine it full of unseen wonders, while locals see it and understand that every square foot of this forest is known intimately by someone. There is no untrodden ground. In my neck of the woods, there's a clear delineation between local and outsider. Pietri's Puerto Rican obituary is not an obituary, not least because its subjects are not dead. This doesn't stop Pietri from eulogizing them, because in his mind, they're dead every moment they accept being trapped in a vicious cycle of work and debt. They're dead every moment they internalize majority narratives about their inferiority to whiteness. They're dead as long as they resent each other rather than supporting each other and positioning themselves against power. As he says in the poem, 
Here lies Juan, here lies Miguel, here lies Milagros, here lies Olga, here lies Manuel, who died yesterday, today, and will die again tomorrow, always broke, always owing, never knowing they are beautiful people, never knowing the geography of their complexion. A life in which you don't believe yourself fully human, the poem posits, in which you don't advocate for living conditions and working conditions that a human deserves, in which you only consider others around you only insofar as they can give you a leg up, is not a human life. The poem's subjects, Juan, Miguel, Milagros, Olga, and Manuel, are moving and working, but Pietri feels that they have lost something necessary to life. He sees this loss, this dehumanization of the self to be so fundamentally sad that he must eulogize them as though they were dead. At the end of the poem, Pietri shouts that Puerto Rico is a beautiful place. Puerto Ricanos are a beautiful race. And then he goes on to identify a beautiful place where his subjects would be if they were alive. If only they had turned off the television and tuned into their own imaginations. If only they had used the white supremacy Bibles for toilet paper purpose and make their Latino souls the only religion of their race. If only they had returned to the definition of the sun after the first mental snowstorm on the summer of their senses. If only they had kept their eyes open at the funeral of their fellow employees who came to this country to make a fortune and were buried without underwears. Juan, Miguel, Milagros, Olga, Manuel will right now be doing their own thing where beautiful people sing and dance and work together, where the wind is a stranger to miserable weather conditions, where you do not need a dictionary to communicate with your people. He laments. It's necessary to note that I don't think this beautiful place is Puerto Rico or any physical location. Instead, this place is a state of mind. It's the geography of their complexion, the world as it would be if they were proud of themselves and lived in a way that was authentic to themselves. The only things keeping his subjects out of this beautiful place are their internalized thought patterns constantly reinforced by external narratives. There are no travel restrictions and their inability to afford travel isn't a barrier to reaching this place because it has no physical location. Years later, Pietri would help to build this place, in a manner of speaking, but we'll come back to that. I'm going to summarize the plot of Kentucky Route Zero next, but I think it's worth noting that I'm summarizing the story of my most recent playthrough. Story details can change depending on what dialogue options the player chooses, so my version of the story may differ from someone else's in small ways. Also, the story is very dense, so I'm inevitably going to skip some important details and spend too much time on others. That's just the nature of this game. Kentucky Route Zero tells the story of a truck driver named Conway. The antique shop he delivers for, Lizette's Antiques, is closing down, and he's on the way to deliver the shop's very last order to 5 Dogwood Drive. When he stops at a gas station to ask for directions, he's told that the only road he can take to reach Dogwood Drive is the Zero, a legendary underground highway that can be difficult to reach. He's told to seek out a woman named Weaver Marquez, named for Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the Colombian writer who invented the genre of magical realism. Weaver tells Conway that the on-ramp to Route Zero is in the coal mines, so he makes his way there. Once at the old mines, he meets Weaver's cousin, Shannon Marquez. When Shannon and Weaver were children, their parents all worked at the mines, so there was a class distinction between them. Shannon's parents were undocumented miners, while Weaver's parents were university professors who returned to the mines in their hometown to record and archive the songs the miners sang. For this reason, Shannon's parents died when the mines flooded, while Weaver's parents survived. Weaver, however, vanished for years shortly afterward. On the night of Conway's delivery, Weaver had appeared to Shannon in a television broadcast, 
in which she told her cousin to return to the old mines where she would find something important. Shannon and Conway explore the mines to find the important thing indicated by Weaver and the on-ramp to Route Zero. While they explore, there's a cave-in, and Conway's leg is crushed by the rocks, leaving him in severe pain and walking with a bad limp. Eventually, the two manage to exit the mines and return to the house where Conway met Weaver, but she's no longer there. Instead, the on-ramp to the Zero appears. Along Route Zero, the pair discover the building for the Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces, a fictional agency which determines if a location isn't being used to its fullest potential and find new uses for locations they reclaim. Conway and Shannon navigate the absurd levels of bureaucracy to find out if the Bureau have records on how to reach Dogwood Drive. After a number of runarounds, they receive the directions, as well as directions to a nearby doctor who can help Conway with his incredibly painful leg injury. The doctor is on the surface, so they leave the Zero to find him. It turns out the doctor's town has been relocated inside a museum of houses, and that the doctor himself left entirely when that happened. But they meet a young homeless boy named Ezra, whose brother, a massive eagle named Julian, has flown several inhabitants' homes to a forest where the doctor now lives. The doctor tells him that he owes his practice to the makers of a drug called Naripnol TM, and in return, all he has to do is use the drug in as many cases as possible. He then uses Naripnol TM to put Conway under, and starts discussing payment plans as Conway drifts off. We are then treated to an intermission in which we watch and perform in a play about debt. We learn from this play that there's a distillery for a whiskey called Hard Times, that the workers who make and ship Hard Times don't seem right somehow, and that the Hard Times distillery will buy debt from people who can't make payments. At the very end, we learn that the bartender of the bar in which the play is set sold the tabs of his customers to the Hard Times distillery in order to stay open and the distillery is sending someone to collect. And then we see... We return to Conway as he wakes up from the Neuripnol drip and his leg is fixed, but looks really familiar. This is a connection we the players make that the characters are not yet privy to. Conway's leg is fixed, but it no longer feels like it's his leg, and the predatory payment plan attached to it would agree. He decides to worry about it later, and the crew hit the road to get back on the Zero. Then the truck breaks down and they meet with two musicians named Junebug and Johnny, who agree to fix the truck as long as Conway and company agree to come along with them and watch a performance they're giving in a bar. They're worried the bar might try to stiff them if there are no patrons, so bringing Conway and Shannon is a way to ensure that there will be patrons. Junebug and Johnny are fascinating characters. They're both robots who were built to work in coal mines but eventually managed to escape the mines. They dress in clothes and wigs and basically try to learn how to become more themselves and less what they were built for, and they do that through their music. 
No matter how human they manage to appear, though, their gears and mechanisms will always grind and whir as they walk, meaning they can never forget what they were built for, no matter how much that isn't actually them. It's a really elegant metaphor for a number of things, and I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't say here that they're definitely written to be a trans allegory. I want to bring that up here because my analysis of them mostly ignores that aspect of them, but it's still a beautiful piece of writing and well worth calling attention to. So the bar turns out to be the one from the play, directly after the patrons had all been taken by the Hard Times Distillery. After an electrifying performance by Johnny and Junebug, The bartender tells them that he cannot pay them, he's too far in the red. Everyone returns to the zero, but the road is out. At the end of the road, there's a massive computer used to run an adventure game, and the computer's creator tells them his game could be used to track down the woman with their directions to Dogwood Drive, but the computer isn't working. When he was building it, it came under attack from some shadowy figures called the Strangers, and he doesn't know what they did. Conway and Shannon volunteer to go to the place the strangers come from to find out how the computer might be fixed. And while they're there... It turns out that the strangers are the strange skeletal distillery workers we saw at the bar, and that the place they come from is the Hard Times Distillery, a huge underground facility which functions as a company town, a place in which the workers live where they work. Because of his leg, Conway is immediately mistaken for a new hire and given a tour of the distillery. Each of these skeletal workers has a whole story of how they reach this point, what they owe, why they owe it but they can no longer relay their own stories. The guide does it for them. This distillery, along with the coal mines from the first act, the Museum of Dwellings, and Naripnal TM, are all owned by a company called simply the Consolidated Power Company. And it becomes clear as we hear more stories of these workers that anyone who finds themselves unable to pay their debts to Consolidated finds their way here. They are all working off their debts, calculating their day's earnings through an equation that makes it clear that a full 24 hours work barely pays off the day's interest. After the tour, Conway is offered a drink of top shelf whiskey to celebrate his new job. As a recovering alcoholic, Conway is unable to resist drinking it before informing their guide he's not here to work, but to learn how to restart the huge computer. The drink is so expensive, however, that he now owes the Consolidated Power Company for it as well. He agrees to return and work for them after he finishes this last delivery to Dogwood Drive, though Shannon advises him against it. The fixed computer connects them with the Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces, in a manner of speaking, and they're told to return to the Bureau to pick up directions on how to reach Dogwood Drive. The directions tell them to catch a ferry and ride it down the underground Echo River, so they do just that. On the river, the arm Conway used to drink the whiskey at the distillery changes to match his leg. He now literally owes the Consolidated Power Company an arm and a leg. Over the course of their trip down river, he drinks more and more, telling anyone who will listen that this job with the distillery will be a good thing for him, that it's not right to leave debts unpaid 
that he's doing the right thing. He and Shannon take a dinghy together to deliver a package, and they're followed by several distillery employees. Conway bequeaths his delivery truck to Shannon, and then, finally, he's gone. Shannon, Junebug, Johnny, and Ezra reach the spiral staircase to the town with Dogwood Drive on their own and decide they will complete Conway's delivery for him, carrying the antiques up the stairs. They find themselves in the town in disarray after a flood tore through it. As the sun rises, the townspeople try to help each other rebuild and to bury the feral horses that drowned in the flood. At the five Dogwood Drive address, an incomplete house had appeared during the flood the final destination for Lizette's Antique's final delivery. As the characters organize the antique delivery and help the townspeople to pick up the pieces, the player is shown the history of this town. It was once a company town for the mines, but after the Consolidated Power Company sent an employee who died on the way, the town became ungovernable, fighting back against the company until Consolidated finally pulled out. There are no roads to or from the town, which was originally used by the power company as a method of control, but in their absence the town has flourished. Every resident is an artist in some way, creating poetry, films, music, and paintings, and sharing their art with the rest of the town on the small community broadcast channel. Before it was a mining town, it was home to the Pueblo de Nada indigenous people from Central America who had followed tropical birds all the way north to this valley. The Pueblo de Nada had lived here for years, conducting scientific experiments and collecting their data in a now ruined building the locals called the library. Before the Pueblo de Nada, a Native American tribe had used the valley as a burial ground, leaving behind mounds of earth spiraling outward from the well at the center of town. The player can see the ghosts of all the previous inhabitants slowly shuffling along these mounds, using them like pathways. This tragic flood, though, was too much for many of the town's living inhabitants. Most of them just want to leave these memories behind now that their homes are ruined and the feral horses are dead. Shannon, Ezra, Junebug, and Johnny, however, each decide they want to stay, rebuild this place, and settle down as a family. This empty house at Dogwood Drive was clearly meant for someone, and it's implied that this was the place Weaver wanted her cousin to reach. The game ends in a new home, cut off from the cruelties of the world, but with Conway gone, never able to enjoy it. I know I shall meet him at the gate when trials are past. I know I shall meet him face to face in glory at last. Oh, I believe that when we meet, well done, he'll say. While trusting my soul and deem in love, I'm going that way. But... Conway's not dead, right? He's just working somewhere. If we took this game entirely literally, flattened out all its absurdities, and transitioned it into the everyday, we'd be looking at a story where a man gets a job, and that job somehow prevents him from doing any of the things we associate with being alive. And this is where we see the connection to Puerto Rican obituary. Uh, the game reviewer Carolyn Petit, on seeing Conway drift off into the distillery, wrote on her blog, My review of Act 2 for GameSpot three years ago began, Conway delivers antiques. That's his job. 
and there's something noble, something sacred about doing the job you're given to do, even in a world that often offers little reward for good, honest work. But now that I see that the endpoint to this mindset for Conway is a willingness, an eagerness even, to have his own identity be wholly consumed by the machinery of the system, I don't think there's anything noble about it at all. I think he's bought into some of the worst parts of the American mythos, and it makes me want to smash the whole fucking thing with a wrecking ball. A life in which you don't believe yourself to be fully human is no life at all. Conway internalized these external narratives. As Pedro Pietri said, They knew they were born to weep and keep the morticians employed as long as they pledge allegiance to the flag that once them destroyed. They saw their names listed in the telephone directory of destruction. They were trained to turn the other cheek by newspapers that misspelled, mispronounced, and misunderstood their names and celebrated when death came and stole their final laundry ticket. They were born dead and they died dead. In 1979, Eddie Figueroa, a former member of the revolutionary group The Young Lords, created the idea of El Spirit Republic de Puerto Rico. The Spirit Republic was a fictive nation, existing only in the imaginations of its citizens, but still providing them with a real connection to each other. Figueroa's concept was inspired by Pietri, who was a friend of his. In the 1990s, Pietri helped to build on the Spirit Republic, which had been converted into a collective art project called El Puerto Rican Embassy. Pietri wrote the national anthem and the manifesto for the Spirit Republic, the former of which is sung at all meetings, and the latter of which is printed in the passports the embassy gives away. In the manifesto, he says, Everyone's imagination is a sovereign nation. Freedom of expression has no boundaries to impede the individual from reaching the other side while alive, to communicate with the dead and escort them back to life, to reassure us that we need no man's permission to be free. There's something striking about hearing this assertion that the imaginary is more important than the real. The material for the Spirit Republic basks in its own absurdity. In 1999, it proclaimed that it was annexing the city of New York in order to decolonize every citizen's brain. They created their own space exploration team called the Coconauts and made a short film and mock-ups that would make it look as though a coconut had been discovered on the moon in 1969. What this allows us to do is question why we categorize some constructs as the real and other constructs as the imaginary. Why is debt more real than the coconuts? Because debt has the backing of institutions that can use violence to ensure that you pay it back. Why is the annexation of Puerto Rico more real than El Spirit Republic's annexation of New York City? Because the United States Navy had the power to blockade San Juan Bay and force the signing of the Treaty of Paris. The very existence of El Spirit Republic de Puerto Rico pulls back the curtain and forces us to reckon with how much we assume to be true simply because of the backing of power and willingness to do violence to people with less power. As I mentioned earlier, the characters of Shannon and Weaver Marquez are named after Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a Colombian writer who was the creator of the genre of magical realism. Cardboard Computer bills Kentucky Route Zero as a magical realist work, as it blends realism with surrealism, treating the surreal with the same matter-of-factness with which it treats the real. Garcia Marquez said that his genre was quintessentially Latin American, that these strange and unexplainable events occurred every day in Colombia, and he was simply writing life as he had come to experience it. Salman Rushdie, Indian-American novelist, believed that magical realism, and I quote, expresses a genuinely third-world consciousness. To Rushdie's mind, in Gabriel Garcia Marquez's works, The damage to reality was, is, at least as much political as cultural. In Marquez's experience, truth has been controlled to the point at which it has ceased to be possible to find out what it is. The only truth is that you are being lied to all the time. So here's the questions I have and that I will try to answer going forward. 
Why did I feel so at home while reading Puerto Rican Obituary, a poem that isn't about me? How is Kentucky Route Zero a magical realist work when it isn't about Latin America, the third world, or exclusively colonized subjects? And lastly, and this one's a bit of a twist, why did I feel such a connection to Kentucky Route Zero, see it as a game that could only be made by people intimately familiar with my mountains, my home, when its creators are not from Appalachia? I felt shocked and betrayed when I was listening to episode 19 of the Gaming Broadcast podcast, in which the members of Cardboard Computer were asked about their connection to the area. And, well, they don't have much of a one. So I'm going to start actually with just asking the broad question of what are all of y'all's story when it comes to the actual region of Appalachia? Um, yeah, well, so we... Uh, uh, I guess we ha- we have a kind of like um, some personal connections to the region, and then and then the the game itself came came out of a, a sort of art historical connection to the the region. But like I said at the beginning, in my neck of the woods, there's a clear delineation between local and outsider, and the creators of this intensely relatable work of art about my neck of the woods are, by any metric, outsiders. In 1978. Helen M. Lewis, Linda Johnson, and Donald Askins published a book called Colonialism in Modern America, The Appalachian Case, in which they argued for adopting a colonial model to understand Appalachian culture rather than the much more common culture of poverty model. They believe that the nature of especially the coal industry had made Appalachia into an internal colony where workers continued to labor for almost nothing to create value that went into the pockets of outsiders while they were expected to adopt the beliefs and customs of their oppressors. This internal colony model is still used a lot to this day, and it's a useful model, but it's not entirely true. We could easily extend the logic behind the internal colony model that any subculture or geographic location that's majority working class, which is almost every subculture or geographic location. Uh, Skaters could be an internal colony. Uh, Furries could be an internal colony. The state of Nebraska could be an internal colony. The Napa wine fields could be an internal... Well, yeah, that, that, that one's actually probably true. The fact that the internal colony model is so useful to understanding Appalachia signals to me something about capitalism. The mechanisms of control the ruling class uses on colonies and imperial subjects have slowly turned inwards, and we now find ourselves maybe not subject to the same degree of violence and control, but certainly subject to a recognizable facsimile of that violence and control. It could even be that this was always the case, but it was harder to make that connection when the system appeared to benefit us. I think a lot about a quote by Bong Joon-ho, the Korean filmmaker who co-wrote and directed the 2019 film Parasite. When he was asked why he thought his film had become such a success and garnered so much attention outside of Korea, he said, I tried to express a sentiment specific to Korean culture, but all the responses from different audiences were pretty much the same. Essentially, we all live in the same country, called capitalism. That makes sense to me. We might feel the effects of global capitalism differently based on our geographic location, the circumstances of our birth, our proximity to power, but the vast majority of us still do feel these effects. Most of us can see our struggles reflected in the struggles of others, no matter how foreign their lives may appear at first. So it should have been obvious to me that an outsider could write a meaningful work about my home. In the end, that outsider has probably lived through most of the same experiences that the folks around me have. I think this was the implication made by the migratory birds at the end of Kentucky Route Zero. The parrots had flown from Central America all the way to the mountains of Kentucky, which doesn't actually happen, in case you weren't sure. I think Cardboard Computer was using these birds to say that Gabriel Garcia Marquez's magical realism has spread beyond Colombia. 
the absurdity of the day-to-day -day that results from moments where constructs supported by power break down and are revealed to be constructs as false as anything else has started to creep into our lives, even as beneficiaries of first world power. The town that Shannon, Ezra, Junebug, and Johnny find themselves in isn't necessarily a physical place, but rather a state of mind in which its inhabitants can see that if the real is imagined, then there's nothing stopping the imagined from becoming real. It's El Spirit Republic de Puerto Rico. It's that chance that maybe there is a Bigfoot hiding somewhere in the spaces that we know. As power serves fewer and fewer of us, we all find ourselves forced to decide if we want to continue believing the constructs is created for us, or if, as Carolyn Petit found herself, we want to smash the whole fucking thing with a wrecking ball. Conway is not literally dead, but he's as dead as the subjects of Puerto Rican obituary. Conway's in a state that we must mourn. He's bought into his own oppression so much that he's closed himself off from five dogwood drive. His dreams will go unrealized as long as he's in this state. But Junebug and Johnny shows us there's still hope for Conway. They were created exclusively for labor, but they built themselves up little by little until they had become their own selves, creating art, finding family, allowing themselves to grow, change, and experiment. Maybe one day Conway can do the same and make his way to Dogwood Drive. I'd have to believe that that possibility exists for Conway, for Juan, for Miguel, for Milagros, for Olga, and for Manuel. Because maybe if the imagined can return from the dead, then that means that possibility exists for us in the real world, too. Aquí se habla español all the time. Aquí you salute your flag first. Aquí there are no dial soap commercials. Aquí everybody smells good. Aquí TV dinners do not have a future. Aquí... The men and women admire, desire, and never get tired of each other. Aquí que pasa power is what's happening. Aquí to be called negrito means to be called love. Thanks for sticking around until the end, folks. I'd like to give a big thanks to my sisters, Christina and Adelia, and my friends, Rachel and Andy, for lending their voices for this video. I'll have sources in the description, so definitely check those out if any of what I said piqued your interest. And maybe I'll make another video in the future. Stay tuned. <laughs>